My name is Barbara. I'm a professor in the Department of Plant and Environmental Sciences here at Copenhagen University, and I'm going to tell you about plants for the future. Actually, plants for the future, because plants, I think, have a lot of the solutions to many of our global challenges, such as how can we feed the people on the planet, how can we feed the animals, and how can we generate enough fuel for keeping the infrastructure of our society. And plants also providing a lot of the bioactive compounds that we use for curing our diseases, like uh, to give us medicine to cure our diseases. So my research is on glucosinolase, the bioactive compounds in crucifer plants. And crucifer plants are all the cabbages that you know. So for plants, these compounds are produced to defend themselves. They can't run away like we can. They have to stay with the roots in the soil. So they are producing defense compounds. And those humans have found out that we can find a use for. And one of the uses is that we like the flavor of them. In mustard, you, the mustard flavor comes from glucosinolate, hydrolysis products. You've also been told that you should eat a lot of broccoli to minimize your risk of developing cancer, or also eat some of the cabbages. That's because of the content of glucosinolates. And then the farmers know that when they grow rape field after wheat field have this rotation in the agriculture, then they get higher yield and the soil borne pathogens are being killed by the glucosinolates that leach out into the soil. So we are growing rape in order to get oil for fuel and for eating. And once we press the oil out of the rape seed, we have a rape cake that's very protein rich, but there's a limit to how much you can uh, feed that to poultry and pigs because the growth inhibitory glucosinolate is present in this rape cake. So that's why the, the farmer in Denmark, they employ a lot of soya to feed to their animals. So we would like to understand how these defense compounds are produced so maybe we can introduce them to other plants or microorganisms or we like to see if we can prevent them from accumulating in the rape seed. So this has been research that's going on in my lab for the last decades. So we have found out the whole biosynthetic pathway in Arabidopsis. And we then thought maybe we could transfer this to another plant. And we succeeded in putting it into tobacco. And then when we saw that it was feasible to engineer the pathway, we then introduced it into potato together with Peruvian farmers. And they are now testing the disease resistance of these plants. And we also succeeded in introducing it into yeast. We have made a microorganism produce the simple glucosinolates, and we're now trying to make them produce the complex glucosinolates that are found in broccoli, so that those people that don't want to eat all that broccoli, they can get it as dietary supplements. So I mentioned that this rape cake has growth inhibitory glucosinolates. We like to reduce the content of those glucosinolates. And the glucosinolates accumulate here in the seed, they are all imported from outside. They're not synthesized in the seed. So maybe we could block the import of these glucosinolates if we could identify the transporters involved in this process. So 17 years ago, we started this project and we have now found the solution. And the method that finally gave us the result was that we built a library of all the transporters in Arabidopsis. We then made the RNA from them and injected it into the eggs of this frog called Xenopus. And then that egg is ready to be fertilized, is ready to translate all the RNA into a transporter protein that it'll put out at the plasma membrane where the transporter proteins normally are localized. And then we could test for uptake of glucosinolate on the egg and see if we could uh, this way identify a transporter. And Yes, we did. You can see here, here's a peak because there was an egg that, were, uh, that has taken up a glucosinolate. So that egg must have a transporter that takes up glucosinolate. So here we ident identified a transporter we call the GTR1, glucosinolate transporter 1. Then the big question was, if we had this transporter and in the plant and we remove it, would we then have no glucosinolates in the seed? So we were looking for mutants of this in Arabidopsis. There's a whole mutant collection where you can screen for mutants in your genes of interest. And we screened for a mutant in the GTR1 and also in GTR2, which is the closest homologue 
in a phylogenetic tree of all the transporters. And you can see when we only knock down one of the transporters, we have a reduction in the accumulation of glucosinolates in the seed. But when we cross them and made a double mutant that had none of these glucosinolates, we get zero glucosinolates in the seed. And that was really one of those high points in scientific life when you get such an unexpected but uh, very nice result. And definitely it shows that the GTR1 and GTR2 are essential for accumulation of glucosinolates into the seeds. We then ask ourselves the question, could we translate this technology to rape? So rape has 12 of those genes. So we started out working in Brassica rapa instead of Brassica napus, which is the name of rape. And we succeeded in finding one mutation in one of the transporters. So when we look at the seed level of glucosinolate, there were over 70% reduction. So that's, that told us that this is very promising. We may be able to reduce the glucosinolate content in Brassica napus, the rape seed. And we're working together with BioCrop Science to see if we can do that. Now I'd like to go back to these global challenges that we all have, the humanity are facing on, the, on planet Earth, and how can we solve these problems? And we think in our department, the plant biotechnology has a lot of the solutions. I don't know how many of you, I assume you know about the first green revolution in the 60s. That was when modern agriculture was born. And that was 20 years of breeding that resulted in a wheat that produced so high yields that the, the fear of starvation in India was not there anymore, so they could feed India. Then we think that the second, revolu second green revolution is coming. We think that we can improve biomass for food, feed, and fuel, the three Fs. We can improve stress tolerance so they can be drought tolerant the plants. We can improve disease resistance. We cannot count on having more land because there won't be more land on planet Earth. We have to use the land we have better. And we have a lot of yield that is lost due to diseases. Insects and microorganisms attack our, our crop. So if we can improve disease resistance, we will gain a lot. We need to have more nutrient use efficient plants so they can use the phosphate more efficient. Phosphate is going to be limiting, I think. I heard year 2033 it's a bigger problem than oil, actually. And we know that all the nitrate that is used as fertilizer causes pr problem with the pollution of our, of our fresh water. And we also like to be able to engineer the bioactive, valuable phytochemicals that plants produce. How can I be so certain that I think the second green revolution is coming? And that's because our knowledge has exploded since 2000, when the first plant genome was sequenced. It was Arabidopsis genome. And we now, there's about 30,000 genes, actually the same as we have in humans. And we know a lot about what the function of these genes are. And we, we know that a lot of these genes are influencing these various different uh, characters. So, so we think that we can do that. We have proven it in Arabidopsis, and we now need to translate it into our crop plants. But how are we going to get there? How are we going to reach these goals? Are we going to do it with GMO technology, or are we going to use non-GMO? And this debate, non-GMO, GMO, that is vicious. It's like religious war. They're really fighting without listening to each other. But uh, something I'd like to inform you about before uh, we take, before say more about GMO, and that is about modern agriculture. I don't know how much you think about it, but it is an environmentally invasive activity. It's not like this picture illustrates where there's one man, he's doing everything manually, and the, the corn is actually almost as tall as he is. Modern agriculture is an industrial business, and modern agriculture reduces natural habitats and has done it for many decades. And agriculture reduces biodiversity. And also, the disarmed crops that we have, because we have taken a lot of the natural defense compounds out of plants in order to get more yield and focus on primarily yield and not resistance. So the disarmed crops, they need medicine to survive and, or not to get diseased. And therefore, we need pesticide in modern agriculture. That's just a, a, a prerequisite for getting the yields that we're getting. In old time, it was one ton per hectare. Now it's eight ton per hectare. And we expect to get 20 ton per hectare to feed the people on the planet. So GMO technology has gotten a lot of these blames that you can actually blame modern, modern agriculture for. And I don't think that's fair. 
I think you should know that the GMO technology has a lot of potential. And that's my take-home message to you today. Thank you.